If you really wanna learn how not to do biceps curls, then go ahead and spend an hour or so scrolling through social media, take 95% of the unique biceps curling variations you find there, study them carefully, and then just don't do that. Maybe that's a bit too vague though. So in this video, let's go over three specific mistakes people commonly make on this exercise that not only reduces bicep stimulation, but also increases stress on the wrists, elbows, and shoulders. Now, hopefully you've already got the most basic things covered already, meaning you're curling a weight that you can remain in control of at all times without swinging your torso all over the place and aggressively dry humping the bar on each rep. You're executing the lift using a reasonably full range of motion and you're using a deliberate eccentric rather than just letting the weight fall back down using pure gravity. So with that out of the way, here are three other mistakes Mistakes you might not even realize you're making. And if you want to maximize your arm gains over the long term, then you need to ensure that you've got each of these covered. All right, mistake number one is excessive shoulder flexion. In other words, allowing your upper arms to drift too far forward as you're performing the curl. This is usually a result of just trying to go too heavy in general, and it essentially turns the exercise into a hybrid between a biceps curl and a front raise, which is going to bring more of the front delts into play and ultimately decrease the work being done by the biceps. If you watch this play out from a side angle, then you can see that as the upper arms travel further and further forward during the curl and the wrists and elbows are more closely stacked on top of each other, the more you start to load that shoulder flexion component and the less you'll be loading elbow flexion, which is the primary function of the biceps. Whereas if the upper arms remain stationary, then you'll primarily be loading elbow flexion all the way through and keeping the resistance on the biceps at the top of the range as well. Now keep in mind that as long as the biceps are still the limiting factor in the exercise, meaning that they're the muscle that hits failure first during the set, then a slight bit of upper arm movement probably isn't going to matter much, if at all, in the long run. And I also think that in some cases, if you try to lift too strictly and too robotically, it can actually limit total muscular overload because you just become too optimal form obsessed, trying to micromanage every tiny millimeter of movement versus really allowing yourself to just drive against the weight with maximum force. In addition, and this is going to be suited towards slightly more experienced lifters, but if you're really wanting to push a given set all the way to the limit, then a bit of controlled cheating can also have its place here and there as well. For example, if you've taken a set of curls to failure using very strict, pure elbow flexion based form, that doesn't mean your biceps are completely on empty. It just means they failed within the confines of that specific form. And there's still the option of loosening your technique up slightly by allowing a bit of torso lean and a bit of shoulder flexion to keep the weight moving and push the biceps beyond normal failure. Mistake number two is performing curling variations that have improper alignment. In other words, where the path of the resistance isn't matched up with the natural curling path of the biceps. The most common example of this would be narrow grip or wide grip curls, where your hands are locked onto a fixed implement like a straight bar, or for narrow grip curls, it could also be a single dumbbell like with a waiter curl or a plate curl as well. When your hands are out wide with the shoulders externally rotated, the biceps would naturally wanna curl inward from this position. And if they're in narrow with the shoulders internally rotated, then they would naturally wanna curl outward. And the problem is that if you've got both hands locked onto a bar or a dumbbell using a very wide or narrow grip, the resistance is being forced onto a fixed vertical line. Not only is that gonna limit overall biceps output, but just as importantly, it's also gonna increase the strain on your wrist, shoulders, and elbows, which can definitely add up over time, especially as you progress to heavier weight. These types of curling variations might seem novel, and they'll tend to feel like they're working really effectively because of that increased burning sensation that they produce. But in reality, this is actually a form of negative feedback from the nervous system as a result of the joints being in an awkward and less stable position, which which is easy to mistake for greater tension on the biceps, even though it has nothing to do with them being loaded more effectively by the resistance. Now, a slightly narrower or slightly wider grip is probably not a huge deal overall, but for the very best results, stick to curling variations where the wrist, elbow, and shoulder are kept in line throughout the movement so that the resistance is running straight through the line of pull of the biceps and directly opposing the fibers. It's okay to curl from an internally rotated position, which will emphasize more of the bicep short head, or from an externally rotated position, which will emphasize more of the long head. But if you're gonna do that, then for internally rotated curls, you want to perform the exercise one arm at a time using a dumbbell or a cable so that the arm can follow that natural outward curling motion. And if you're externally rotated, then it can be done single arm or with both arms at the same time. But again, stick to dumbbells or cable attachments rather than a fixed straight bar so that the arms can naturally curl inward. And if you are performing curls using a straight bar, whether it's free weight or cable or some type of machine curl, then just use a basic shoulder width grip. If you're finding this advice helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on future videos. And lastly, mistake number three, kind of related to the point that I just mentioned, and that is selecting your biceps exercises primarily based on feel. In other words, emphasizing curling variations that produce the strongest overall sensation, and then automatically equating that with increased muscle building effectiveness. Now, this might seem counterintuitive because it would make sense that the stronger you can feel a muscle working, the better it must be for hypertrophy. However, once again, and like I covered in a full video a while back, there are a wide variety of reasons for why a given exercise might produce a stronger feel that have nothing to do with an increase in actual mechanical 
tension on the muscle. And in the case of the biceps, the truth is that the most effective curling variations are also the ones that probably have the lowest degree of sensation overall. And that's because the biceps don't generate maximum force or experience maximum tension in the shortened position, like with a preacher curl, where you'll get that really strong cramping burning sensation on each rep. And it also doesn't happen in the lengthened position either, like with an incline curl or a facing away cable curl, where you're gonna get that intense stretching sensation. The biceps actually produce the most force and the most overall tension on exercises that emphasize the mid-range position, meaning basic barbell, dumbbell, or cable curls, where the movement starts with your arms directly at your sides. I actually made a video about this a couple years back, explaining that barbell curls are one of the most underrated biceps exercises, and that most people can probably build their biceps right up close to their maximum potential just using that one movement alone. And a lot of people thought that was too simplistic, but I still stand by that. The biceps really don't require much in terms of exercise variety. It's a fairly straightforward muscle with a basic function, and if you're progressively overloading a regular standing curl, your biceps will continue to grow over time. And even anecdotally, back when my arms were at their very biggest, barbell curls and dumbbell curls were literally the only direct biceps exercises that I did. Now, I'm not saying to not perform shortened or lengthened biceps curl variations. You can include all three types of curls in your program to be 100% sure that you're not leaving any gains on the table, but don't make the mistake of thinking that just because you can feel a certain type of curl more strongly, that it automatically must be more effective, or that because a regular old-fashioned standing curl seems too basic or doesn't give you that same crampy, burny, stretchy sensation, that it must not be as good. I'd say, if anything, you should probably be prioritizing those basic mid-range curls and then using shortened and lengthened position curls as optional supplemental add-ons. If you want some more help getting your overall fitness program onto the right track, whether your goal is to gain muscle, lose fat, or potentially do both, make sure to visit seannell.com custom. Just fill out the short form on that page and I'll send you back a free step-by-step -step training plan based on your current condition and goals, along with an easy to follow nutrition plan as well. The link for that is in the description box. For effective supplementation, visit realsciencealthletics.com to check out my own line of research-backed, clinically dosed formulas I personally created to maximize your results. Here are two more videos I'd recommend watching now. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date. Thanks for watching guys and I'll talk to you again soon.